and we're all one. It, it really that trip changed me forever because it made me realize like yeah I just I stopped judging people I stopped hating on things and I just realized we're all one some people just they they need to almost trip to see this yeah it would change a lot of things I, but at the same time I fear for some people to trip like this because this was one of those trips where eight hours had passed and I wasn't and I, I truly thought I messed up my brain. Right. I remember me and my friends thinking like, holy crap, are we mentally handicapped? Yeah, because you could never go to work like it, that. Yeah. yeah. And I couldn't stop phasing in and out. And I was like, dude, I think we really screwed our brains up here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're here with Harris Talunzik. He's a 170 fighter out of Fury. Fi uh, got fighting. LFA. That's what I said. LFA. <laughs> okay, well... Uh, interesting okay because basil's and fury i get yep. those two mixed up but what do you think about the two organizations and which one's better or worse i think they're almost even yeah i think one's representing like the uh southwestern uh, region but also they're bringing in people from out of country and then lfa kind of represents the midwest and the east well then you you got another promotion up east too that's really prominent uh cffc and okay. so that really represents the East, but LFA is more Midwest and Brazilians, and now they're even bringing in Russians. So all three, they're basically the same thing. Yeah, I mean, opinion. yeah, and they're, I mean, they're all feeding into the UFC, UFC yep. and... However, LFA has the most UFC fighters. Okay, there you go. And I, I could see that. I know, I, what I love seeing is when you guys go up to the UFC and they'll show clips from past fights. Yeah, yeah. And then they're either you're wearing the sheath. Yes, yes. Or you got the banners in the background or something. We should be able to do that in UFC too. Yeah. Oh, the I know. Sponsors. I miss that. I do too. Yeah. It, I mean, mainly for uh, weighing in in the underwear. Mm -hmm. I, would, I wish that they could. Yeah, wear they it. won't even let you do the underwear now. Because I, I remember Basil was asking the UFC, and they were like, "No, you got to wear the Venom gear." He's like, "That's a sponsor, though." Oh, and so they still he shut him. Yeah, he asked multiple times. This, oh, this, the thing with Basil is, uh, you can tell him no. He'll still ask a second time or try to compromise in one way or another. He's really good at talking. Really yeah. good at negotiating. Yeah. Really good at it. And uh, he tried, and they still wouldn't let him. They were. No go. Good. No go. I just had a really busy week, yeah, too. Yeah, so. I'm literally just getting back to training today. Okay. Yeah. What did you do? Just So my little brother had his wedding, and he booked an Airbnb in Florissant, Colorado, yeah, but in the right woods up, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's right up the road. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a dope spot. And uh, my, my family and his wife's family all stayed in two separate cabins up in the middle of, in the, middle of the woods. It was like a five- or six-day little you know mini vacation that involved his wedding and all that stuff and it was just a blast man we were gonna go shooting and do a bunch of outdoorsy stuff but the weather did not cooperate with us so uh just typical colorado you know yeah the weather changes on you split every second, so yeah it was just raining it was like thundering thunderstorming here the roads are soaked on the way yeah you know shooting up water and stuff so you got to get out of the city and just yes, get, yes. stay in the woods and kind of get grounded a yep. little bit yep which is my favorite thing to do i hate to be in, so uh a lot of people know this you know if you follow me on social media i come from nebraska small town nebraska and as soon as you're out of school or as soon as you're uh you know done doing whatever you're doing you, you you spend time outdoors you don't do a lot of indoor stuff you know other than i grew up wrestling that was indoors we spent all our time outdoors we did a bunch of country hillbilly crap and so and then i moved to from nebraska to montreal in canada wow for training and it was just a culture shock concrete jungle city life nobody sleeps it was a complete 180 degree not to mention everyone was french and spoke a completely different language so it's yeah. literally like I know it's a different country, but you don't imagine Canada's a different country. Right. So I went to a French province. It was a huge culture shock. Not only that the language is different, but it was a city life. COVID hit after about two years of living there. And then I come to Denver and another culture shock, all city life. And so anytime I try, I get out to the mountains or I can get out to the mountains, it's no brainer for me, you know. Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me of that Nebraska country living. That made me think of Anthony Smith. I think. He, oh yeah, I like he's he's from this my neck of the woods. Okay, <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't know how small a, a like community it is, but have you met him or anything? Yeah, we used to train together. So nice. we trained together for a couple of years at uh, Factory X, and uh, dude, that dude's a beast. 
Yeah. yeah. When he fought John Jones and got kneed in the head. Mm -hmm. And, and then didn't it. take the DQ. I know. He could have been the champion of the world. He doesn't care. He's a beast. I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't blame him. Cause that, that's like, if you, if you tap out or if you, you know, if you don't fight on, then you're like a pussy or whatever. Yeah. And then if you do, then it's like, but you so could have won. I used to, here's the crazy, this is so crazy about this up. It's, it's so ironic. Um, I used to judge him a little bit for not taking that because I was always thought, you know, this sport's about money, man. We're all broke, or at least when we're on our way to the top, we're all working our asses off to just make a financial, you know, situation out of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, for Anthony, if he would have just took that, that win, he would have changed his life substantially in financial aspect in the sense that he would have been making title or championship money now, go mm -hmm. forwards. Whether he wanted to... Uh, rematch John Jones or not would have been up to him at that point but the fact of the matter is he would have been making a lot more money if he'd have been champion rather yeah. than not and I judged him I said dude uh, I was just saying to my friends I would have took the W I would have took the W because F John Jones you know he his whole career is plagued if this one incident you know happens to me and I, at the end of the day people are gonna look at it as this is just another John Jones thing you know they're not gonna judge you too much but it's hard to think you know critically when you're in that situation and Years later, my only loss to this day as a fighter, uh, it happened two fights ago. And uh, a lot of the reasoning was uh, in the first minute or two of the fight, the dude threw a nasty teep right into my nuts. Uh. It, it was so bad it was, that uh, they, they obviously stopped the fight like normal, but uh, they actually put a curtain around me. And I'm, I've watched fighting for crap since I was 12 or 13. I've never seen this happen in an MMA fight. They stopped the fight. They're doing the injury time and the doctor can tell I'm in serious pain. So they wrap a curtain around me and they have me actually take off my shorts and underwear and everything in the middle of the cage in front of everybody. So I'm completely naked and the doctor is examining my, you know, my package and he's looking at, I could see in his face, it wasn't right. I didn't want to look down because I knew it would mess with my mental, yeah. but I looked down and I was like, oh shit, it's already bruising. This is bad. And the yeah. swelling was getting, it just, it didn't look right. And I look up and I, I see in my corner and they're kind of like telling me, you know, it's mental, you know, you decide, it's on you. And it, it without a doubt, I didn't even think twice. I said, I'm, I'm going to keep going forwards. Yeah. I said, F it. I, I, people were booing me. People were, you know, cheering, booing him. I heard all the noise. But at the end of the day, I, I, I just was like, I don't know. I'm a fighter. I'm a warrior. He could have poked my whole eyeball out and I probably still would have said, let's keep going. Like what happened with Fer <clears throat> Ferguson this weekend with Bobby Green. I don't yeah, know the eye poke. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, not that he would have been put out, but it does change the it dynamic. It changes the game. Yeah. Because you're, you're, it's weird, man. You have to be in a fight. It's like chess. You have to be 100% focused on your opponent. And when something happens that you didn't factor in or you didn't plan for, your state of mind completely changes. And it, it, you almost lose focus and start thinking about, oh, shit, what's going on? Have I yeah. ever got through something like this before? Have I ever seen something like this before? And then for me in that instance, I had never got swelling like that on my package before in my entire life. So it really bothered me for a round or two to the point I couldn't, I couldn't be myself. Yeah. I couldn't uh, Get in the zone. be the athlete that I normally Flow. am. And I rewatched that fight a thousand times and I, I'm not one to make excuses, man. I, I've never have been. I'm just not that kind of guy. I don't believe in excuse makers, but I truly believe if I would have just taken that DQ in, I would be a lot happier today about my the entirety of my career than I am not taking it because I truly believe he won the fight because of that. And same with John Jones versus Anthony Smith. I think John won the fight because he need him in the face. I mean, yeah, it was a hard knee. Yeah, he was down and it was obvious. He was. I remember he was like leaned up against the fence. And, Dude, it was hard. Yeah, and if you, I mean, the rules are the rules. If you fuck up accidentally whether it was an act i mean you're a trained fighter i was it made me also think of al jermaine sterling versus mm. whatever and where he did take the dq win peter yon peter yon and then everyone was calling him a bitch and fucking you punked out but then you know he came back and won the next fight and then they everyone shut up right yeah and now Everybody. he's a champ and now it's like oh he's dangerous well dude that's a great point uh that was actually a great point i didn't even think about that yeah because uh, I used to think all Jermaine's kind of cringe too, and I didn't. That was before I had taken my own L. And, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. And it's it, it's it's weird. The sport's really um, revealing. It it really makes you humble, 
it kills your ego and it really makes you look at things in a different perspective. Yeah. Like before I was a fighter versus now, seven, or nine years in, I have a completely different perspective on life and it just involves every aspect of life. I love fighting. I love the discipline that it takes and the, the ego thrashing mm -hmm. that it provides. It's like a blessing. And I mean, I don't want to... Especially for assholes like me, dude. Well, Guys who think they're the shit like me, they need, to, they need to go into a fight gym. They need to go into a jiu-jitsu gym and get humbled. Because guys like who i was nine years ago are the problem with the world you know guys who walk around with their egos and they they start shit and they 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 don't know their own purpose that's the problem i truly believe it's men that are, i'm not a feminist or anything but i believe men who don't know their own purpose who have never been humbled are the problem with this world i i, I yeah, know. no, absolutely. They're the ones like causing, uh, they're complaining all the time and mm -hmm. whining and like you, you don't have a purpose and you're trying to get in everyone else's business mm -hmm. and and be like a social justice warrior and look at me, I'm yes. better than you and I'm going to tell you what you're doing wrong, but you're not doing anything. Right. Yeah. So shut the fuck up until <laughs> you've done something with your life. Like, please sit back and watch and like do something, work, yes. quit talking. Yes like talk 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 yes you need to do shit that you were like going towards this perfect segue uh i wanted to bring up jake paul and you were like it's a mm -hmm. problem and people without direction and fighting g gives you a purpose and yes i just watched the documentary on netflix that i don't know when it came out but it's pretty recent it's this year <clears throat> and it's you know he's about to fight nate diaz and it was all, it was the good and the bad and the ugly from when he was a kid his YouTube channel, how it was so cringy, but Did he was show just, the suicide forest thing. Yeah. 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 yeah that was yeah. bad. So yeah, they showed all the bad shit. And my daughter actually was like, you can't sponsor, um, Logan Paul because he did this thing. And I'm like, well, Hey, he's now looking back. If you watch the documentary, he's a kid, uh -huh. he's trying to get views. Mm -hmm. He's trying to, you know, get views and get numbers. And he was actually battling with his brother, Jake to get the, the biggest YouTube channel. And it got really dark and they show how, it turned into like a really nasty rivalry where they hated each other. I yeah, I, I highly recommend watching it. It's like the problem child or whatever documentary. It goes all the way up through Tommy Fury fight. And even that footage of the Furies with the Pauls and they're all together in this room. And it's like they they knew they were about to make a shitload of money. So they were all <laughs> happy. They were, I mean, even though the fight was about to business happen. Partners. Yeah, no, yeah. it was a business deal. And all, and whether these, I don't think that they're fixed. That knockout of Tyron Woodley. I don't think it's fixed either. Yeah. I know. I went through that back and forth. I just don't think it is. Not? How do you fix it? Yeah. WWE is obviously fixed. Right. You can see it. You can, I don't think you can fix fighting. Not these knockouts. I don't know. Yeah. But in the, the it, it's such a good documentary because all the hype and everyone's like, he he's a fucking YouTuber. He's not going to be shit. And Dana White's saying Ben, he'll, he'll bet a million dollars Ben Askren's going to win. And then, like two seconds later, Ben's like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, a guy like Ben Askren, for example, I don't believe he would be okay with, you know, duping all of society. Yeah, he's a real, you know, martial. He grew up wrestling his whole life. He's he's a real martial artist. I mean, in every aspect, I don't think he'd be okay with fixing a fight i don't yeah. think that so i i really think he knocked these guys out which is crazy it's so wild but you, then you look at the the work ethic and that's kind of what i wanted to get into with mm -hmm. you also like he has a million dollar camps jake paul mm -hmm. you know and you're and you and a lot of the up-and-coming fighters are doing your best to go, go train two three times a day and go to the gym but mm -hmm. you don't have a whole team around you massaging you right, and stretching right. you and blowing smoke and like breathing exercises and all these things and you can do it all but it would help if you had a team kind of like supporting that whole mission right right yeah and what so what's your training like and how much you know help do you have in, in that effort yeah so i mean training is insane i mean you kind of hit it on the nail there for any regional guy any guy trying to get to the ufc it's pretty much the same thing i mean you're hitting boxing, Muay Thai, Jiu-Jitsu wrestling, and then strength and conditioning all within one day. And you're doing two to three workouts a day. It, typically, you're working out Monday through Saturday. And if you're smart, you know, the new era is different, man. So back in the day, you trained three times a day, and 
you know, you did whatever in between. The new era is completely different. We take it 100% seriously. It's our life. We truly breathe it. Like in between sessions, you're doing things to recover. You're drinking and eating certain foods and supplements that you know are going to just give you a small edge for your next workout. And uh, like for me, a day-to-day, I mean, thing like on a Monday or Wednesday, for example, those are my most strenuous days. Those days, I'm doing three workouts a day. Tuesdays and Fridays is typically a sparring day. I don't spar twice a week unless I have a fight coming up. So I'll actually let me spar once a week. But even that one sparring sh- session, I'll get six to eight rounds. And these are high-level guys trying to kill you. Yeah, get I ready saw for fights. at the gym. At high, I keep saying high altitude. Is that what it's called? Yeah, well, the, the so the... The gym itself is called High Altitude. The team that the fight team inside of the gym is Elevation Fight Team. Yeah, and I mean I saw Cl- um, Curtis Blades, mm-hmm. Gaethje, Sanhagen, you, Basil, and a few other recognizable names. Yeah, that's a badass gym. Yeah, we got Neil Magny. Yeah, uh, Neil Magny was there. Literally every regional welterweight you can imagine is in Usman our gym. has has Usman, Usman uh, so he was there when I first showed up a couple months ago but he hasn't really got a fight schedule or anything so I think he's doing his own thing with Whitman okay but uh you know people say once he's got a fight he's there all the time too so or at least sparring anyways I should say yeah so you're sparring is that the day that is that what you that's sparring. I saw that was sparring. Yeah, Friday. Is that what you were talking about? Yeah, Friday. Uh, so Monday, Wednesday is like the most difficult days as far as like the amount of training sessions we have. Tuesdays and Fridays are difficult because we got sparring. And if you're really, you know, doing the right things, you typically got another workout after sparring. Like me and Basil and a couple of the guys, Caleb Crump um, and Anthony Adams, after sparring on Fridays, we'll go to Barways and do our strength conditioning. We do that two to three times a week. And that is just brutal, man. That's a different level. Of You're like lifting weights and power lifting. It's very shit. functional. So it's like push-ups, pull-ups, lifting weights, sprints, you know, biking, almost like a CrossFit workout, mm-hmm. supersets. Imagine like four to five sets in each superset and you got three or four of those per day. And it's nonstop. You're jogging to the, to the next thing. You just... you. The best way to describe it is you're inhaling your own sweat. Uh, it feels like you're drowning. It feels like they're waterboarding you. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's wild. That makes me think of when I, I joined the high school basketball team. Uh-huh. The way you made the team is if you didn't quit. And they just ran us and ran us through drills and sprints and the suicides until people quit. And I just remembered saying to myself, if you just don't quit, you're, you're going to be team. on the team. And I made the B team. They made two teams because a certain amount of people didn't quit. But I made it. And I was so proud of myself. I Hell just, yeah. I loved... Yeah, because you don't have that quit in you. Yeah. It's a big thing. I mean, and whether it's B team or A team, it doesn't matter. That's just someone else's perception, you know. That, and that's the way I look at rankings. It's the same as a ranking, you know. You can rank me whatever you want. I know in my head what I'm worth and how good I am. I know how hard I work every day, every week. You can. I'm an LFA, fa- LFA fighter right now. But I know with 100% like sincerity and confidence, every ounce in me, that I'm a top five, top 10 UFC fighter as nice. I'm sitting right here. You know what I'm saying? And it, I know because of the work I put in. I know because of how I do at practice. I know because of, you know, the uh, results I get and uh, week in or day in and day out. It's just I put in the work. I put in the sacrifices. And then on top of that, you know, a lot of us guys, especially myself, we go to work. We do, you know, random jobs here and there. I, I was telling you before we, uh, me personally, I, I do a lot of crap. I do uh, deliveries, so I deliver for Amazon, or I did my own delivery thing, like a 10.99, where I delivered a set amount of packages for a guy, and he paid me cash at the end of the day. What kind of packages? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. All sorts of stuff. Whatever yeah. you need. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I did that thing, and then I also, you know, me and my wife, we do a little bit of e-commerce. You know, we we buy and sell and. Just anything to make ends meet, and uh, you, were t- you were saying that your apartment was full of all these full products. Of crap. At one point, our living room, dining room, and storage room was all completely full. We were literally giving away crap for free. Yeah. Like, at, when family would come over, we would have them leave with boxes full of free stuff, and it wasn't just like crap. It was good stuff. It was really, yeah. you know, good stuff. We just couldn't sell eBay. It's it's a weird thing the way eBay and Facebook Marketplace work. It's not instant. Mm-hmm. You know, you you go through a bunch of customers to sell one product, and you have to be diligent. Pictures got to look good. Your descriptions got to look good. It's not. People think it's just like one of those side hustle things or whatever that Gary Vee does on yes, TikTok. Gary Vee. Yeah. It's like, dude, it's a lot more than that. If you want to actually make money, and it to be a legitimate side hustle, 
and we took it seriously and it, we still do and you know anything to make ends meet and knowing eventually that all this this training i'm putting in this beating down on my body this and you know working these dumb jobs while everybody else has a career and a 401k and a, and a roth ira knowing in the end it's all going to pay off one of these days i'm going to hit that 50k bonus just like basil did yeah, that was plus dope. plus you know have a fight of the month, fight of the night, and just be recognized by the whole world for all this work. Like it yeah, happens. You got fight of fast. the month, huh? Fight of the month, fight of the night, uh, 50k bonus, and most importantly, and I witnessed this myself, and a lot of people don't see this behind the scenes, but he got respect from the UFC matchmakers. Like nice. And I know a lot about these. I've been in this sport for a long time. I've been at the highest gyms or some of the biggest gyms in the world, and I've heard. I know a lot of uh, just a lot of dirt, and uh, I know that it's very hard to earn the respect of the UFC matchmakers and Basil did that yeah on he his fucking first freaking showed up. fight it was so <laughs> far and I, even when he lost it was yeah. a split decision loss yep. everyone thought i thought he you know it could have gone either way so the reason he lost is cuz i fell through the judges table ah uh, i heard something about that you tripped or something <laughs> Yeah, it's a crazy. This is I don't know if that's actually the reason. So you were um, you were cornering him, which is pretty cornering dope. him. Yep. Yeah. So and it's weird. Uh, they don't really tell you much until you're about to walk out, and they tell you right as you're about to walk out, uh, kind of like the uh, arrangement of things. Two coaches can go in the in the cage, and one has to go around and stand behind Basil, you know, for the camera to see you behind the cage, mm -hmm. kind of hyping him up, just the way they want to do their thing. And uh, so we. Us coaches, we didn't even listen to what they said. We were just like, whatever, dude, get away. You know, we'll focus on Basel. Right. So when we walked out, we did our thing, whatever. First round ended. We hadn't even decided who's going in, da 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 da. So I go, at, you know, I was with Steve Hordinsky and Justin Hofton, both gym owners, both, you know, respective like masters in their art, Justin being a master in striking and Steve in jujitsu. And me just kind of like, you know, I. I'm great at everything. I'm not a master at anything. I looked at both of them. I said, you two got to go in. I can't go in there. That's embarrassing. You know, I can't disrespect you two like that. I go, I'll walk around the cage. So, you know, between first and second round, no problem. That was cool. You know, we didn't have any issues, no conflictions. That sounded like the right thing to do. And then in between the second and third round, bro, I was just in disbelief. I couldn't believe what Basil was doing. He was kicking ass. And the way the crowd was reacting, like everyone was on Basil's side. Like they were cheering him on. It was just a difference, like environment in there and us corners were fucking hyped hyped like never before and uh, like multiple times they tell you you know you can't stand up from your little corner bench i stand stood up like three or four times like just oh you know screaming like we got this and at one point i thought we were going to tap him out at the end of the second round he had him in that head and arm and yep. i was telling basil he was like just squeeze a little more he's about to tap and you know whatever time round out and so i'm hyped and I, we second and third round, or the bell hits after second round, and Steve and uh, Justin go in there, and I was like, oh shit, I gotta get behind Basil, so I just, you know, to kill time, I jumped over the steps and then tried to sprint right to him, missed the video camera cord, the huge oh. thick cord, dude, thick, and literally, and I'm, I shit you not, I did like a 180 degree spin, like, <laughs> and then. I flew off the stage because I was sprinting so hard and the momentum was so fast when it caught me. I flew completely off the stage, both feet, and just landed back first through the judges' table or like a WWE. Yeah, exactly. Thing. And the table collapsed, and three oh computers uh, flew. Cords ripped out of the cage, and I looked at a couple computers that are completely, you know, ruined. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my god, I'm in disbelief, right? I can't believe this is happening to me. And my knee's killing me, right? Right away, I could feel a sharp pain in my knee. Oh man! So I'm injured too. On top of this, and because uh, the way I fell was just insane. It's a fall. It's a hell of a hot fall. And I stand up, and a bunch of doctors start running up to me on the sideline. There's still about 30 seconds left to run. This happened fast. And I go, no, no, I don't need help. Get away from me! And I just jump over back over the table and back on the cage and I tried to stand behind Basil and I couldn't I fell to one knee because mm. I was in so much pain yeah and I just you know cheered him on whatever and 
walk back to our little corner and th the doctors kept trying to check on me and I was like, no, no, I'm good. But it turns out, dude, after, uh, when we got back to town, I couldn't train for a week because my knee was so swollen. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. I actually did hurt my MCL a little bit. I was swollen and stuff, so. I have a torn meniscus or MCL or something <laughs> that I got training uh, jujitsu. I was training with this white belt and I was just passing his guard and he thrust up his hips as I was passing, which really shouldn't have done too much but it tweaked my knee and it, pop? it popped yeah so there was a pop and i was like okay and we finished the round and then i we were starting a second round and i was it was getting like worse and worse i could you know feel the swelling and i couldn't push up off of it and so i ended up finishing the class and limping home uh, you know and i haven't trained since then but How long ago was that? It's been a while, like and then months. You, could, were you able to like extend your knee and lock it? I yeah. At first, no. It's but it's I can run on it. I can do all hmm. the shit right now. I just can't. You know how if you're like trying to shrimp or something, because um, the foot's put, planted. Yeah, it like the a twisting push off of the ground just is problematic oh, for me. I hate knee problems. Man. I know, they right? Make me literally cringe. Yeah. So after my last fight part of the reason i haven't fought in so long i've been fought since november of last year yeah i was kind of thinking that long it's time. been a while yeah yeah so in the middle it's one of the craziest fights in my life by the way i fought this this I, I was just so anxious to get back in after my first loss that i texted my manager and said put me on the next card as soon as possible you know i was so mad about the whole nut shot thing yeah not performing i said put me on the next card don't text me the opponent just you know just send me the contract nice so they did that and it was a heavy hitter omoyeli from uh chicago i did no research on this guy whatsoever because i was like f this i don't care i'm just gonna I, i'm just gonna go in there and win i was nice. like that's all i know you know I'm, i just i'm not a loser bro i hate losing whether it's anything i i freaking hate losing and uh me too <laughs> big time yeah so you know how i feel yeah i didn't care who it was and I just knew in my head I would beat anybody because of the way I felt. Love I know that. when I feel this way, I'm unbeatable. I'm invincible. And so they gave me this guy. I do no research on him. Well, it turns out he's got one freaking weapon. It's the left overhand. If I just watched two videos, I would have known this. Uh. Shit, but I didn't. <laughs> so I made this what should have been an easy finish for me, you know, just based off the experience I have. I made it a dog fight for one round. He dropped me twice. I dropped him twice. And then I ultimately swept him off his feet in a clinch. And then ground and pounded him with some elbows and choked him out. But the first, just, I don't know which time, but one of the times he dropped me. And if you watch the video, dude, he didn't, this wasn't like, a, oh, Harris got dazed and got back. This was like, a, I completely went unconscious, Whoa. drop face plant on the canvas don't know how drunk this ref was to not stop the fight nice but he must have for some reason just love my ass <laughs> face plant the canvas get back up do that twice and the ref never stopped it once like any other ref probably would have stopped it yeah but this guy didn't and so then it gave me the ability to drop to him twice which is crazy to think right and ultimately sweep him and finish him all in one round and um one of the times he dropped me I you can't control your fall when you're dropping. Obviously, you just you don't know what happens. I um, must have twisted my knee, and what happened was as soon as the fight ended, which the ref actually raised the wrong person's hand, the ref didn't even know who won. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> he raised his because there's so many knockdowns, he didn't know who won, so he raised his hand. So I had to walk in front of the ref and the guy and just kind of like go in front of the camera and block the view and like act, you know. So the crowd understood because I have a lot of family in Bosnia who watches, and they don't get these things. And they, they don't did, understand yeah. fighting at all. Yeah. First of all, you know a lot of people. You know how foreigners are. And so I had, to, I knew in my head, I was like, "Fuck, everyone's gonna think I lost." And the split second decision, I was like, "I gotta get in front of the camera and you know let everyone know I won." And as soon as I did that, and the camera turned, I collapsed. I had to get carried out by the corners back to the stage because I couldn't walk. I literally felt like mm, the upper half of my leg and the bottom half weren't connected. Mm -hmm. And the bottom half was so numb. And I felt this f pain before because I tore my meniscus early, early on in my MMA career in jiu-jitsu against some random white belt who tried to do a heel hook. Oh. And then he had, we started in the heel hook position. It was a drill. And you go live from there. Mm -hmm. And this a-hole just twerked it and pop, pop, pop without even me being able to react. 
And so I felt this pain before. I knew right away my, menis my meniscus is torn. Gets to the back, whatever. They asked me, do you want to get checked out and go to the uh, emergency room? And I made this mistake after two fights before. My knee was swollen because of kicks from it. And I told them, yeah, I'd love to go get checked out. And then I never went and got checked out. But I didn't know that meant they suspend you indefinitely until you actually go get checked out. Oh, wow. So then I booked a fight and then... You know, I did the whole training camp, and then one week from the fight, uh, commission contacts me and said, hey, you are indefinitely suspended. You never went and got checked out for that injury over six, eight months ago. Yeah. So I learned my lesson. I was like, don't tell the the, the fight, the commission promotion or whatever. Or whatever. You're hurt yeah. unless you're really, really hurt. Yeah. So I was like, no, I'm fine. I'm just going to get this figured out on myself. So I left the arena, and I could not walk, and I got worse by the, by the hour. And the next day, I really realized I screwed up, and it was too late. You know, I, and my pride was like, no, you'll deal with this on your own now. And That's you can't take the suspension. Yeah, I was like, you can't take the suspension, bro. And so I go back to town, and a week later, nothing. Not better. So I go get an MRI, and I tore my meniscus completely and my MCL. It's both of them. And then on top of that, what the orthopedic surgeon said was causing me the most pain was I had severe swelling like he'd never seen before on my knee, the actual bone. Mm. And he's like, so that's actually what's causing you most of the pain and swelling. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, you must have hit the canvas really hard with your knee. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I guess. Because that's the only time that I actually hit anything with my knee. And yeah, so that freaking injury put me out. And the orthopedic surgeon was legit, man. He wasn't, he was very honest to me. He looked at it multiple times and he told me, he said, I really don't think you need surgery. As crazy as that sounds. And I believed him. And he said, you need to do this for eight weeks and then this for two. And I, I stuck to it like religion. And over the course of 10 to 12 weeks, it fully recovered. Nice. And I went to sparring. And I sparred uh, big uh, Rob Wilkinson. He's 2022 PFL champion, light heavyweight PFL champion. Okay. I have a round with him. Huge guy. And I threw, I'm doing pretty good. I threw a body kick and he caught it. And I tried to twist and run away, mule kick, and it retore again. Oh. So another two months, believe it or not. And I tr I think it wasn't 100% healed yeah. or it wouldn't have retore, right? Right. Because I'm, I'm healthy, man. I, I do it all. I do the supplements, the joint care. I take care of my body. And I really don't think I gave it enough time. I rushed it. And so I retore it a second time. And now it's been since last November that I fought. And I finally got something in the, on the books at the end of October. Uh, for LFA main event, hopefully my last LFA fight. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Let's get you in the big. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to go. Big leagues. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, because I'm older, obviously. So I know how those knee things go, man. It's yeah, and I don't want to go back early. When I was yep young, uh, playing basketball, I'd roll my ankle. Yep. The next day, I'd go out and play, and then it's compromised. It rolls again. Yep. And it, I I did that repeatedly throughout my high school car career, and ultimately, it's like. I, fucked my shit up like permanently yeah yeah, that, yeah that's what ultimately happens right yeah it never builds back 100 percent if you don't allow it to in the first place exactly so i'm letting this heal i'm not going to go back i just actually texted rainy the she's the owner of brazilian jiu-jitsu school mm -hmm. at the end of this road when you're headed back to 25 on the right right before the highway there's a brazilian jiu-jitsu school and they have real brazilians like they don't speak english the instructors it's pretty cool <laughs> I mean, he's very, he's like Hobbit. He called me Hobbit. That's badass. Yeah, and, and they have like translators there. Really great school. But after my, I messed my elbow up skating the other day, I was just like, okay. I've been putting her, I've been putting her off saying, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back. And finally, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to wait until I'm fully. Fully 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't need a re-injury and... I'm. I don't need to do that, but I do really love it. I love right. after a roll. That's and I just I like the sparring. I was going there to spar, and you got to do the fir first half of the class, which it's is really fun spar. also, to spar in the, yep. the last fifteen minutes. And I just and I, I was sparring with guys like you and like these athlete like college athletes, football players and stuff. No problem. And then I roll with this like white belt dude, and I when when. When they paired us together, he was like six five, and I'm five eight, which is fine. I didn't see, I didn't care uh -huh. about that, 
but he had this weird look in his eye. He was like, he wanted to get some. So and, much ego, man. Yeah. I know and I wish said. that I had like kind of thought about like, hey, you, I need to, you, I need to tell you to chill. Yeah, already. Yeah, before we start, mm -hmm. and I, I had him. I'm, I'm decent. I've been doing this since I was 20. Like on, I, I remember I started in my dad's living room. My buddy was like, "Have you tried rolling?" And I was like, "No." And so we moved all the couches, and he just oh badass. Yeah, we just started fighting for position. Mm -hmm. You know, starting like uh, fighting for guard or full mount or whatever. Mm -hmm and and the workout itself was good like i was like this is fuck i remember just laying there <laughs> afterwards you know just like spent completely yeah. burnt out but it was awesome so i love it i've been doing it forever i did it in the army they that's what they teach you in how long were you in the army six years nice two Thank tours you service you're welcome i'm a huge fan of the military well i never had the the balls to serve or you know go out and but I, so I'm just a huge, huge supporter, huge fan. I know what it takes, and yeah, yeah. It's uh, the basic training, and it was really fun, and that's where I really excelled. And I was up against 260 other soldiers, you know, going through the same thing. I beat them all Hell in yeah. physical fit in the APFT Army Physical Fitness Test at the end of the basic training. I got uh -huh. the award, which. I'm still bringing that up. <laughs> <laughs> I would too. <laughs> and then I, I did really well in the army in general, just, uh -huh. you know, land nav shooting. It was leading, um, the, you know, team, team leadership and stuff. And it was just really fun. I really you said you did two tours also. Yeah. Where'd you go? I went to Iraq both times. Oh, wow. Yeah. I went to Balad the first time, which they called Mortaritaville because they would just lob mortars over the fence like constantly. And we had these C-Rams, which were these giant like machine guns, but like times a thousand. And they would, brrr, they would shoot the, the mortars, the mortars out, oh, the you know, out of the sky before they got in. And it worked? Yeah. Most of the time. So that would happen all the time. <laughs> but sometimes they would get through. My, and that was my first tour in 2006. I joined in 2006. I was Holy in Iraq crap. by Same that. Year. Yeah, before the end of the year. How it, old were you? 26. Dude, that's yeah. crazy. So I was like, I, turn, I was like your age, basically. Yeah. And yeah, my, my life was kind of going why'd nowhere. You join the, why'd you join the army? Yeah, I was just, I was in a, at a dead end. Yeah. My college tuition, like my, I had loans that I couldn't pay any money that my parents had given me my grandparents had been spent i was making 12 dollars an hour uh doing payroll which was cool like at a corporate office for eye care centers of america and but it was like okay and i just felt like i was at a dead end the war was going and they were giving out bonuses thirteen thousand dollars at the time i was like that could change my life army? Yeah. yeah just to join Jeez. and they paid off my college loan and then I ended up getting the GI Bill, so I went and got I got my master's degree after like while I was in and after uh, I got out of the army. So it was a huge springboard, thing. yeah, for me to become a man. I felt like I became a man. Absolutely, I was very immature, and but testing yourself against other men or and women and and compete and standing up and you know you're like okay I can do this shit. Put me up against anybody. <laughs> Dude, that, and I was just going to say that. I feel like um, a lot of business owners are ex-military. Mm -hmm. I feel like to be a business owner, it's similar to being an athlete. Like mm -hmm. you have to take risks and you feel the same type of feelings I feel a lot of times like yeah. before a fight, like those same emotions. Maybe they're not as sudden, and um, but over time you feel the same things. Mm -hmm. And like, the anxiety, I feel like am, am, am I going to make mil it? Yeah. yeah. In the military, I just personally feel like it sets up people to do, to go take risks. Because yeah. I, a lot of business owners and a lot of successful, you know, men and women are ex-military. I'm always like, when I figure out they're ex-military, I'm like, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it just it's it seems if you know whether it fixes people or enhances people, it does something for people. Yeah, I've noticed that about the military. Are you from Colorado or did you come here because the military? I or came here because of the military. Where are you from? Yeah, San Antonio, Texas. Oh, that's where that's why you said you had family there. Yeah, Texas. and that's where I joined and. You know, I was under the impression that there were these weapons of mass destruction. 
<laughs> I, was I, 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 I was told that there were these weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and that's why we started this war. Oh, for real? That, I've, okay, so I've heard of that. That's a yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a real thing? Yeah, but, but it, you know, we never found them. And ultimately, I, when I look back, I think it was a war for oil and money and territory and you power. You really think it was? Yeah. Yeah, because they said, you know, it was because we got attacked in the Twin Towers in New York in 2001. Did Bush do it or no? <laughs> I think he let it happen on, or, or some kind of weird, you know, weird. Something weird happened there. Yeah, I something, feel like. funky. something funky. Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't yeah. know that he did it, but it was. He was like, "Well, if we let this happen, we can start a war." Yeah. and you know, it's like the Epstein to... thing. There's something funky there. I just don't know what. We'll never know because we're just civilians. Okay, the cameras just happened to not work in his cell when he committed suicide. Dude, bro, come on. They lie to us constantly. And then, uh, biggest uh, child trafficking sex scheme. Only him and his girl are the ones to get. Yeah, prosecuted. And so I, I know she got like 13 years, but R. Kelly got like 20 years. So he, he she was like, I'm glad I didn't pee on them. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Yeah, that, that was like what was this was like went a Family over, Guy episode. He went over the line. Yeah, I love the Family Guy. I like South Park. South Park is killing South it. South Park Family Guy. Uh, a good one I was just thinking about. Very dark humor. Very, very funny. We you gotta be a different type of person to appreciate that humor. I love. I mean, we sponsor all the comedians that are the like the darkest and the <laughs> most fun to listen to. Yeah. So usually, I, if it's funny, it's true. A lot of times, I always say that. If you're laughing, just the most, it's partly true. Right. Sometimes the mo people say the most outrageous things just to say the most outrageous thing. Also. Yeah. So it's one of those. So yeah, then you're like, oh my god, I can't believe he said that. It's fucking hilarious. Yeah. Exactly. Trump. Yeah. He's. A trip, but you know, Good who, shit, man, one of the funniest guys, yeah, ever of our time, anyways. Influential. I liked what he was doing with when it comes to like, um, he was very positive and he was like, We're gonna win again, yeah, you know, and and bring manufacturing back to yep. America, inspiring the people. Yep. I don't, I feel like Biden doesn't inspire, not very patriotic. It's almost yeah. like he's anti America or the U.S. flag, yeah. I don't get it. That, well, I don't get why a president would ever allow that perception of him to be out there you know what i mean why wouldn't you you could kill that perception overnight i mean there's just simple things you could say and do to make you be patriotic and mm -hmm. deserving of that position and biden refused to do that and i think but uh, trump did a really good job of that and that's why you have diehard fans and because you know we haven't had that for freaking decades dude i'm yeah. not a i'm 50 50 on trump i just like that uh, my biggest thing i like you know that he's conservative obviously yeah i'm a conservative myself me too i like their policy i like i'm relatively liberal but i'm also i'm more yeah, conservative I, dude, I could compromise yeah if we could find a progressive median i would be more than willing to compromise however we don't live in that time and age maybe our kids kids will be able to deal with that or do that but in our current you know state of affairs if you aren't conservative you have to be the left and the left is fucked up it's fucked up. They're insane. Insanity, dude. It's <laughs> fucking insane. Yeah. There is no middle. Everyone can say and argue, you know, I'm I'm if you really talk to your friends and family, we're all in the middle. Yeah, I agree with that one hundred percent. But not everything that we feel is the reality, you know, and people have a hard time understanding accepting this. The way we feel and the way reality and society is set up are two completely abstract things. We feel and know this is right, but unfortunately, the society isn't set up that way, and we have to deal with what we're dealt with. Yeah, You're nobody wants homeless anything. people on the streets. Nobody wants no. babies dying. Nobody and shit. wants drug addicts. You know, if I could do something to help them and not be depressed or whatever, when depression is a whole other subject, I, I feel a whole different, you know, way about that than the left does. But if I could help people not feel that way, I'd be more than willing to, and I try to, and I try to help people all the time. You know, on social media and through my posts and stories, you know, try to inspire people. But at the end of the day, if you, the saying goes, you know, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. Yeah. And that's literally in my mind, the, the left, the people who vote for the left and the people who support that stuff. They're trying to make horses drink water that they don't want to drink or something. No. You can, like, um, but the water's poison. So the water trying to make you drinks poisons, you know, it's it, 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 either way. It's just insanity yeah and they can't handle tr that's my thing against trump is they can't handle him and they go so crazy yes that i don't want to have to put them through that mm -hmm. but 
I, f I mean, he was way better. I mean, I think there's no no denying. Yeah, and I would be cool with like, uh, you know, freak dude, if we could have Ron DeSantis or someone more moderate, you know, representing the right and the conservative party. I hate to say the right or the left. It sounds so stupid and divisive. Yeah. I, I just want to say the Americans. Mm -hmm. It Because it just sounds divisive even saying right or left, conservative, liberal. It's so sickening at this point. I'm so sick of the division. But at the same time, I understand we have to have make a choice. You have to choose right or left. So I'm not ignorant and stupid. I know, you know, which one's more right or more correct. Yeah. So I have to go with that side, but... I feel Ultimately, like I think we all yeah we want someone progressive in the middle. Yeah, somebody reasonable, but yeah. like all, like to me, what separates the right and the left is the right is like I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna I'm gonna get it done. The risk takers, right? Yeah, and then the left is like, how come he's doing it? How come I can't get yes. what he's doing? Or must be nice. Yeah, must be nice to have that. Well, I th and fighters, there's no equal outcome in no. fighting. You know, you can't, both people can't win. Somebody's right, right. Of... You have to understand this part of life. Um, so I'm a religious person. I'm Muslim. I grew up Muslim. You and don't so, look, well, anyways. I don't look Muslim, I know. So my little brother's name is Muhammad, though. So if I uh, hang out with Muhammad, you might. <laughs> like, okay, that was maybe. stereotypical. <laughs> no, it's okay. I grew up in Nebraska. Nobody knew we were Muslim. Literally nobody. I'll never forget I had an AP history class. And this fat bastard told the whole class, you can't have the name Muhammad and not be Muslim. And for the longest time, I was hiding to everybody I was Muslim because growing up in Nebraska, yeah, you're, you're insecure about oh, everything. Yeah. yeah. Growing up in general, you're insecure. Especially in the last 20 years. Oh, where dude, it's it, horrible. You know, this yeah. is post 9 11. This right. is fresh. Like 9 11 hit in second grade. You know, you can't be Muslim in, in Nebraska. Hell no. Bro. <laughs> oh, no. So we hid that shit for a long time. And this fat ass in this AP history class in high school says the class is a huge class. You can't have the name Muhammad and be not be Muslim. You have to be Muslim. And I remember it was the craziest thing. Everyone in the class looked at me, dude. It was fucking insane. And I just got red faced, whatever. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm Muslim. <laughs> Your middle name is Muhammad? My, my younger brother is the okay. one who just got married. Right, Muhammad. right. Okay. Yeah, his so he Muhammad. Would, that's where he was. So that's where it's from. like, you know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And for whatever reason, he just said it. I don't know why he said it in his class. And uh, everyone looked at me, dude. And it was just one of the, those profound moments in my life that truly changed my entire life i'll never forget this moment yeah it was the, the the defining moment of my life where i decided i will never be embarrassed to be a muslim and i will just accept who i am for who i am yeah and understand that i couldn't chose where i was born what i was born into what i believe i could control what i believe but ultimately i do believe islam is you know what I need to believe. There you go. Just, you know, whatever. And I believe. I mean, it all. And actually, I'm okay with everything. Like, they all lead they back all to the same God. They yeah. all coincide. They're I all think connected. at the end of the day, when we all die, yeah. God willing, I think we'll all be in the same place. I really do. I, I believe I, that. I, I, really I mean, do. even if you just trace the lineage of the Bible with Abraham yep, and Muhammad, yep, and yep. it's all, they're so, like yeah. sons of Isaac exactly. or whatever. So, Ibrahim, you know, Abraham, Ibrahim his, uh, he's essentially uh, both Isa, which is Jesus in Islam. Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon him, they both derive from Ibrahim, which is, the, you see what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, the it's lineage. All, yeah, dude, it's, it's all, it's in a way, it's all connected. But anyways, so it was a defining moment in my life where I was like, dude, I'm just going to accept, you know, that I'm Muslim. I'll never, because it was so embarrassing to get called out like that and, you know, have everyone figure it out like that. And so from that moment on, I was like, you know, I'm just going to be proud of who I am. I'm like Muslim. It. It's who I am. You know, uh, the reason I act the way I act, the way I talk, the way I talk, the way I believe in myself and what I believe is all because I'm Muslim and hiding it isn't helping me at all. It's just taking a part of me away from me. I'm and assuming so, you've read the Quran. Then, yeah, absolutely. Because I have it at, in my, at my house and I, ha and I opened it and I started reading it and it, it was like a little off-putting because uh -huh. it, it seemed like there was it was all automatically say and correct me if i'm wrong uh -huh. here because i stopped reading after <laughs> the first couple of pages but it was you know how they say that if you know if you don't convert to islam oh, they'll kill you or something in certain regions and i don't even know if that's true yeah but it seemed like the bible was or the quran was promoting that and i was like well that's not nice because i'm not Muslim. right right and there's so the thing with the quran is uh there's only one original quran it's never been rewritten and it's the word the word the original version the version that most muslims follow is in arabic and 
there's obviously a big issue there. A lot of people don't speak Arabic. In fact, most people don't speak Arabic in the... Do you? I don't speak okay. Arabic fluently, no. Yeah. So I speak Bosnian fluently, I speak English fluently, and I learn Arabic, you know, as okay. I become more Muslim, of course, yeah. and study the religion. But um, as time went on, you know, they translated the Quran, and uh, some people just don't translate the Quran correctly. Yeah. And so you can read the Quran in a Bosnian translation, and you can read it in an English translation and get two different yeah. texts almost. The, the, the most pure and original text is in Arabic. And if you truly find someone who knows Arabic or an imam, essentially a priest mm -hmm. in Islam, um, who can translate it for you, you'll find it's a lot more beautiful and peaceful than nice. the translations are. Good. Yeah, the yeah. translations are a little skewed. They're off. Sometimes I swear they're written by someone who's anti-Islamic, which I understand. Like, some Muslims are anti-Christian. I hate that. I, I freaking hate that. There's It goes back to division and racism and all that Well, and, and some Christians are anti-Muslim and vice versa. People person, always so think they're better than other people. Right. It's just I have the right religion. Right, no, right. Mine's the correct exactly. religion. I'll kill you <laughs> <laughs> over who's correct. Neither one of you know. Yeah. No. Nobody knows. I truly yeah. believe we'll end up all, we'll all end up in the same place. Yeah. I, don't, I, I just, I don't know. Something in me tells me that. I, I guess it's just my intuition and from what I understand from every religion and what I've gained from the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran. I'm a huge... So another thing, if you follow me on social media, you'll know that I'm a huge... Uh, I fear death a lot. It's something since I was a young kid, I used to fear death. I still do to this day when death is brought up. I don't sleep for days. Sometimes. Interesting. Uh, it's something I truly fear. I, I can't get over it. I've talked to people about it. I, I, it's a phobia that it just, it's almost like a disease. Yeah. Religion brings me comfort. It's one of the only things that brings me comfort when speaking about death. But um, I think that, uh, and so it's weird. Like I actually, I believe that we someday will be immortal humans. I, I do believe we'll invent, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, microchips that enter our bloodstream and work to kill diseases and prevent us from aging mm -hmm. or we invent ai that we can you know converge with our, our flesh with or whether we you know upload our brains into a microchip at the end of the day what makes you you and me me our soul mm -hmm. for example can be described as your opinions and your experiences in life and that's truly what will always separate you from me and in order to make a, a clone of you, for example, or to keep you from dying per se, you would have to keep your opinions and your memories intact. Mm. And those exist somewhere in our brain. Mm -hmm. We just don't know the brain very well to figure out where and how those work. We do know aging is a disease. You yeah. know, this is a thing. Aging is a disease just like diabetes or cancer. Essentially, is a process of your cells degrading, the telomeres mm -hmm. and the stem cells and all this stuff. And so aging is a curable disease. It's mm -hmm. obviously going to take a lot of time and research. But um, whether we cure aging or find a way to transport those memories and opinions into a database of some sort, I, I truly believe immortality is one day going to be upon us. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't hit me, then, you know, I always go back on my religion. But some people say, you know, you're Muslim. How could you believe in immortality? How could you believe in this and that? But nowhere in the Quran, I mean, if you read the Quran... You read the Bible, there's a story of Noah, Noah's Ark. And if you actually read the story, Noah was 800 to 1,000 years old in that story. So how did a guy live 800 to 1,000 years back then? And we're dying at less than 100 now. Yeah. You know what I mean? So maybe immortality isn't living forever, forever per se, but I certainly believe we aren't living at the full capacity that humans are supposed to live, the full extension at what mm -hmm. humans are supposed to live. And I truly believe there's a lot of work to do. And... Religion. We're getting closer and closer, though. We're getting There's closer and closer. These... Religion brings me comfort, but also science brings me yeah. comfort. One, another interesting thing I want to bring up before I forget about it is uh, I, I obviously study history, too. It brings me comfort in this subject. But uh, um, Egyptian history is really cool for me. I, I think we all have happened to come from somewhere in that area. Yeah. I, do. I think in the Quran it says we all come from the land of the Sphinx, which mm. is obviously Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, but in the hieroglyphs, like there was a... a drawn out like scripture or whatever like a, a a picture and it talked about this one prince or king and his dog and in it he talks about how much he loved his dog from day one to the day it died and the part that i found was interesting was the dog lived 15 years this is thousands and thousands of years ago today we don't have dogs living eight but nine years and everyone just thinks it's the norm 
on my but this guy in Egypt thousands of years ago, his dog lived 15 years. We've clearly effed something up in longevity and mm -hmm. the process of life with all of our, you know, industrialization, our access to food, all this crap. Like we've taken a step backwards. There yeah. is a lot. If we had just kept going forwards from that point on, man, maybe dogs would be living 50, 60 years today. That'd I just, be... I think it's odd that they actually decreased their lifespan versus increased. Yeah. In such a um, harsh environment like Egypt, you know? Mm hmm. I, I, I would take a thousand years. I, I, I'd be like, I'll compromise. Give me a thousand, please. You know, I'm okay with a thousand. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm a big a Twitter guy, and now it's called X. But uh, so I follow only guys involved in the stock market or intellects like Lex Friedman and Elon Michael Musk, Malice. Michael Malice, Matt Walsh, all these guys. I, I like to follow different opinions. I will follow even, even the left. I'll follow left politicians and right just to get different you know opinions and sides, mm -hmm. kind of form my own opinion. But one of the interesting things I saw one time was Lex Friedman and Elon having a discussion about aging and death, and mm -hmm. both of them agreeing that we will be immortal at some point and basically saying, if we truly live in a democracy of any sort, we should have the choice to choose when we die. Yeah. I mean... The hell but, you you gave birth to me without asking me now let me choose when to die because i'm loving this i know and there's so much more to do <laughs> so much more to do i want to go to egypt and paris yeah and... i don't want to spend like i spent nine ten years of my life fighting and training like, yeah truly just you know how it is like the martial artist life like going to bed early waking up not hanging out with anybody not drinking not smoking just this disciplined lifestyle, like, I want to spend 10 years fucking around too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe 100 years. Maybe I want to do for 100 years. Yeah. Like, I don't Wild know. out. Yeah, I don't know, dude. Yeah. This isn't enough time. I know I know for a fact, this isn't enough time. Yeah. It's if you're not. telling me I'm going to die at 100 and I'm already 27, I'm 25 to 27% done. Dude, I'm in the no, middle range. Yeah, and I'm bro. like, fuck it. I'm, I'm on the downhill slope. Bro, I'm I like, was please. working at uh, JCPenney in college. So, funky story. People are like, you went to college? Because I actually got expelled from high school. Interesting. I got caught smoking weed on a wrestling trip. I was 36, 38, no, at the time. I had Division One scholarships all over the country. And uh, I got caught smoking weed on a wrestling trip in Minnesota. And these, these assholes, they drove me back from Minnesota to Nebraska, expelled me and kicked me off the wrestling team and said they were going to set an example out of me because, you know, I thought I was this undefeated hot shit, hot shit guy when yeah. this goes back to the whole ego yeah this all it was all a combination of everything i'd done in my life essentially hit this equilibrium point when i had everything going for me mm -hmm. scholarships life was going to be good it all hit me all my ego and i kicked out the wrestling team got expelled from high school it took me a little while i had to go to an alternative school to get a, a ged and eventually i would go to a community college rather than a Div division one and complete my geds and Kind of over the course of that time, you know, I really had a lot of epiphanies in life as I was going to community college. I was like, man, you know, I, I was going, I was studying criminal justice. In my mind, I was going to be a lawyer. I was mm. like, criminal justice isn't enough, right? I'm going to get my bachelor's. I'm going to go to law school. Got to set the bar high. That nice. was always how I was in wrestling. Do the same thing in education. My dad was a physicist. He was a mathematician in Bosnia. He's a professor, professor at one of the biggest uh, universities in Bosnia. Cool. So education-wise, he always set high standards for us. And I did the same. I was like, fuck it, I'm going to be a lawyer. But two years into community college, dude, I had this epiphany. I was literally working at JCPenney. It's crazy. I wrote out 100 tallies on this piece of paper. And that was uh, represented 100 years. And then I crossed out each one for how old I was, 21. And I looked at this piece of paper. And I looked at a piece of paper, these tallies. And 21 crossed out. And that left me with what? I think uh, 79 left. And I looked at this piece of paper and I was like, holy shit, I've lived this much of my life already. Right, if if I happen to get lucky and live to 100. Right. I looked at the paper and I was working at JCPenney doing something I fucking hate, going to school for something I didn't really want to do, just settling because my parents were that. And I knew if I dropped out, they would kill me. You know what I'm saying? But I also knew going made them super happy and proud. And I looked at this piece of paper and I was like, but they could die this year or next year, right? And they've lived their whole life. And then I've spent all this time for them. Mm -hmm. And I only have this much, but what if I die here? And I was like, dude, I need to start living for myself right now or I'm going to like lose it all. And it, it hit me in this JC Penney's in this basement of this store. And I was Ugh. like, dude, I swear to God, I, I never forget it. And I looked at this. I could not stop staring at this piece of paper. I had this horrible anxiety attack. 
it hit me like I felt like I was gonna die tomorrow. It felt like doomsday was coming, bro. Whoa. And I just was panicking. I couldn't breathe. I drove home. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't talk to anybody. I was like just sweating all night. I was like, oh my, I'm gonna die anytime now. I've done nothing I've wanted to do my whole life. I know it's crazy to think, right? <laughs> Not really. And then no. it just it, it it just lit this flame in my brain and from that day on. I've never stop chasing my dream and that's to become the best fighter in the world something i've always wanted to be yeah i've, I've loved uh blood sport jet lee bruce lee anything growing up hell yeah fighting i've always loved the idea of me beating someone i feared because i was bullied a lot growing up you know yeah trying to hide who i was and yeah being fake all the time i was bullied a lot growing up and so i always loved the idea of beating that guy up that was beating me up all the time and fighting was it and i never really chased it until that that moment and of course my wife was always my she was my girlfriend at the time but she was always in my ear like go do it go do it you always talk about it like what are you doing yeah but it was that's awesome yeah, to have dude, that support it was yeah yeah but equilibrium of those two things dude, i just ah, man you have those moments in life where everything just like i know for you you went to the military yeah you're just tired of yourself it was for me i was just tired of myself tired of doing shit for everybody else and then looking at it on a piece of paper, like literally physically seeing it, you're like, holy crap, I've used a fourth of my life, bro. Woo. A fourth, and I could die 50 for all I know, dude. Yeah. Who, who's the Sam I live 100? Crap, my plane could crash, my car could crash. It hit me hard. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that happened to me, I was in my late middle, mid 30s. I tried mm -hmm. this substance called dimethyltryptamine. What? DMT, as... baby. <laughs> <laughs> and it. Have you tried it? I've done L I've I've dabbled with LSD pretty hard. Well, because hard. this was this was like so not the same, but yeah, sort of. And I've done I've done that, okay. and it's it's similar but different in the sense that I left my body. I okay. literally had an out of body, out -of -body experience, experience. Okay. which made me think that the consciousness could exist outside of the body. Absolutely, and that and that alone made me lose basically my fear of death because mm. you know I, mm. I, it okay. was so real to okay. this day I, tr I left my body i saw myself leaving my body i was outside my body looking and outwards I, in yeah outwards in and then i traveled to another dimension where there were these jesters in a glass house drinking tea and they look they it's like they saw me come in and looked at me and they were like yeah and what i interpreted from that because it was like they were communicating with me telepathically was basically like we got this under control we're here this does exist but you need to go back to your dimension do the work there basically don't come back here uh, but you saw it you got a glimpse it's real but go back and do holy and, shit yeah and and it was I'm not very even, profound dude i believe you 100 percent. yeah i have this type of experience i'm not going to one-up you or anything but i've had a similar experience interesting i 100 believe you on this that is very similar i mean very uh insane yeah very similar to my experience too very what out of, what did you see dude uh so it's crazy and i tell people this all the time uh life is all about numbers you know everything is a number in a way or shape or form i freaking i in college you know me and my friends we had always taken a tab of lsd and then there was this one time we it was like we all knew it was the last time we were going to trip together you yeah. know we all had our own things going on right girlfriends jobs school you know everyone's transferring this and that summer breaks coming and we all you know we all decided we're going to do three tabs and typically we only did one tab right right so we tripled up the dose of lsd nice and we, yeah <laughs> <laughs> dude it was fucked, it was fucked. <laughs> and so we start off in the college dorm tripping and eventually we make it into a car. Uh, what, of course, it's a sober driver. You know, we never would yeah. you know, question driving like this. Yeah, that's insane. Sober driver, we get in a car, and he drives us from the dorms to a rental property I have to go, you know, because we're like, we can't be in the dorms. This is getting really crazy. Like, we're starting to laugh, we're getting hysterical. We have to fuck out of here fast. And we knew we were going to leave, you know, eventually, but we realized we got to go faster than we thought. It was kicking it's in. It's kicking it fast. <laughs> so... We leave and we're getting hysterical, but on the way there, I'll never forget it. The semi almost crashed into us. The semi almost crashed into us. We uh, went through the green light, the semi ran the red light, and essentially we almost T-boned him. We would have gone under him and just been fucked. But my buddy slammed on the brakes. And when he did that, it was in that instant moment the trip hit for me. And the semi turned into the entire tractor and trailer 
turned into a set of digits completely transparent i could see through the entire trailer and tractor it just was digits interesting and i was like so a huge like equation basically we almost crashed into a huge equation and i was like well, that was insane and then whatever it started going and i'm looking at the back of the trailer and it's another equation representing just the back of the trailer I'm like, wow it's a completely different equation i'm like huh that's weird numbers and so i started looking at the road and the grass and everything's numbered and i'm starting to realize everything is compromised of a number in some way shape or form whether you're deciding how much asphalt this and that da, 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 the grass the Wait, ground yeah everything is associated to a number um and i was able to see the genetic makeup essentially of everything and then i looked down at myself and i saw these numbers and i saw my own it was as if i saw a genetic code that essentially said this is the code that makes up you i looked at my buddies they had the same completely different code everyone had a code everything was a number and it dawned on me dude i was like this is an insane universe we live in Isn't you know it? it's insane bro yeah. it, was, it was so I can, i'll never forget this I, I tell people this all the time they asked me what my craziest trip was it was this and i just seen these numbers i realized in some way shape or form we are all one i know it sounds like that trippy mushroom guy we're all one we're all connected mm -hmm. like this table it consists of some sort of equation that created it you know whether the the, the woods maker used an equation to create this table mm -hmm. similarly the growth of the tree yeah, yeah similarly the creator of us used an equation to create the exact makeup of you but we're all created based off of bases and numbers and things like that and we're all one and it, it really that trip changed me forever because it made me realize like yeah i just i stopped judging people i stopped hating on things and i just realized we're all one some people just they they need to almost trip to see this yeah it would change a lot of things I, but at the same time i fear for some people to trip like this because this was one of those trips where eight hours had passed and i wasn't and i i truly thought i messed up my brain right i remember me and my friends thinking like holy crap are we mentally handicapped yeah because you could never go to work like it, that yeah yeah and i couldn't stop phasing in and out and i was like dude I think we really screwed our brains up here and we were all panicking for hours yeah and so i don't know if anyone if everyone has the mental fortitude to deal with that yeah but i i don't know and maybe there's a there's a level for maybe the doctors need to do the study on this and shit. yeah I forgot more research needs. definitely more, more research. research i just there's went, something to it though yeah i just went to the psychedelic science uh conference in denver two weeks ago and aubrey marcus and aaron rogers were talking do you know Yep, either one yep. of them okay so just them talking these two highly effective rich professional like professional athletes mm -hmm. super bowl champion mvp um and this billion or multi he sold he just sold his company for 500 million aubrey yeah so if they are into this scene and like the you know experimenting with psychedelics mm -hmm. I, I was like and i had already been a you know in experimental mm -hmm. throughout my life really but it kind of got me back into it a little bit so i'm like re re dipping back in. yeah yeah so for me i told you like we all knew this was gonna be our last trip i haven't had a hard acid trip since then just because i don't even know you know do you want one <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk later we'll talk later <laughs> but, uh, but uh so I, I i started i i was like i told myself i was i don't want to trip like that for a while the fear of like thinking i was mentally handicapped yeah it really effed me up for a couple of weeks like it would the but ultimately also like seeing those numbers it, it also like i wanted to know more i was like i gotta see more and so i started messing and dabbling with mushrooms mm -hmm. and then my first trip in montreal man these fuckers in the dorms these kids are crazy in canada by the way crazy at tristar and these kids gave me these mushrooms they said how much you want i said i i'll need a quarter based oh off how much i trip and i hadn't tripped in years wow so right away i just ingest a quarter oh of mushrooms my God. and then the guy comes in you could tell this is the mushroom guy he's just a muay thai guy right from thailand he goes uh how much did you eat and i said i ate the quarter he goes oh dude <laughs> no you didn't and i knew based on his reaction because he's the mushroom guy i was like i fucked up this is about to be uh, another one of those things and it was it was uh, one of those moments where uh it truly changed my life. I remember laying in the in the dorm bed hours later in the trip. This this light and this sound just kept flashing into the the entire dorm. You know how people say you hallucinate and you see things? Bro, the light was actually there. I saw this light. 
and it came into the room and it was it was god i know it was but everyone can say you know you're tripping this and that but dude the, the things it said the way the sound came in the way my body felt and vibrated i could feel it was something supernatural interesting something came into that room you know and i actually have a i'll send you it when i get home it was the only time ever i remember tripping so hard i said i gotta whip my phone out for this one i gotta start writing and oh. i just started typing as i was tripping and mm -hmm. i was experiencing this godlike feeling in this room that god was in there killing my ego killing you know everything about me and yeah i just started typing it was the craziest message it was like basically all about how much i love everybody my wife my family and it's weird man yeah it's hard to believe it's not something supernatural well i mean in, in the experiences we've all had with that experiencing uh, everything is one the love mm -hmm. the answer is love it's just like yeah. that's the answer to everything it's mm -hmm. like they should either prescribe it or promote that right yeah. does that sound right yeah that way i mean and then we you know, how we did it turn an more. asshole like me and his loving guy you know what i mean like it's doing something mm -hmm. i mean don't get me wrong martial arts did a huge thing but i before i got really you know detailed and everything my, the killing of my ego yeah because i didn't know where this conversation was gonna go yeah i didn't want to obviously just yo the reason i have no ego but a lot of the killing of my ego you know was honestly tripping out yeah it, it, well and it shows you just a different perspective of life and energy and a different understanding mm -hmm. it just opens your mind yeah up, like whoa okay i don't know everything yes yeah. yes yes being so, able to accept that is hard yeah yeah you know it's another interesting thing and I, this is why i say maybe not everybody's mentally adequate for tripping is like every time i've tripped uh for, i don't know if anyone does this but my brain goes through everything i've regretted from the last trip yeah so it's like it does these like it doesn't go before that last trip though but from the last trip until now so if i trip now i haven't tripped in what two years so if i trip now everything i've done in the last two years that i i regret but i didn't speak out on mm -hmm. but i regret those actions or those words it's gonna hit me when i trip yeah. and sometimes i fear tripping again because i'm like do i really want to deal with those regrets again yeah. do i really want to deal with those because those thoughts are so buried in my head the only thing i can actually bring them out is some sort of you know yeah lucid substance. dreaming yeah substance. yeah and sometimes um, it's scary but sometimes i'm like dude just you deal with fights you know deal with this you got to man up and kill your ego <laughs> and deal with these regrets and figure out why you regret doing that and saying that and it, it's always the same thing it's because it wasn't it wasn't the right thing you weren't yeah. being a loving guy you were being judgmental everything i've ever regretted or every time i tripped and i regretted something i noticed every time it was an action or a word i said that was negative or it wasn't the true nice guy that i really am yeah it, was it shines a light on that yeah, and, yeah. And it exposes that so you can grow and learn and that's why i say it kills your ego yeah i think that i mean but like how often that's the question because a lot of people do it maybe too much yeah you know it's like yes, if it's supposed yes. to heal you and cure you why are you doing it every weekend true you know true. this is where it gets a bad rep yeah yeah, versus maybe guys who are more moderate. Yeah, and I'm ch I typically my, like I'll do maybe every three months, every uh -huh. six months I'll do like a major trip, and then in between here and there I'll do some micro dosing. But the yeah, micro dosing is good. Yeah, that's more chill yeah. because the, the, when you take the full dose, the heroic <laughs> dose, that was a heroic <laughs> dose. That is serious. You know, yeah. you're going in yeah. for something serious, and you better. You got to prepare yourself for that. Well, the, the problem with the heroic doses is a lot of people doing them are kids. Both of my heroic doses came from the peer pressure on me. I wanted to look cool to everybody else. Like, watch this, motherfuckers. You know, both of the heroic. And I didn't. And then what came from them was like, whoo, here you go, Harris. And I, I yeah, I yeah. Got my butt served on a plate. Yeah. You know, it sucked both times. I mean, it, it, in a way, it killed my. It was probably overall looking back at it in hindsight. I'm glad I did them, but I'd probably never do a, a dose like that again for us. Yeah, life. seven no grams. Need, dude. Yeah, no, that's yeah. insane. The first tr one I ever did, I had never tripped. Nobody even told me mm -hmm. what it was going to be like. I was with my older brother. They blended three and a half grams and some orange juice, and then I just drank the orange juice. And I had I had never done that before. I didn't know what to expect, and you know the fucking walls start breathing yep, and all yep. that and and i remember start looking laughing. yeah it was great until i kind of fell into the situation you were where it's like hours have gone by and i'm like i can't live like this yes, yes. yeah 
I mean, this is cool, but is this going to wear off? Yeah. Because I don't know what's happening. And I think that this is the rest of my life is going to be in this weird state of mind. And I just started trying to make myself throw up and I was like, drinking milk. And <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, you know, it came down. And so it was your generation that made the milk. Man. Uh, yeah, I didn't know what to do. I was just trying to make it stop. But I like it now and I appreciate it. But that's the other thing is like back then we didn't do it with intention it wasn't yeah, yeah it's just it like was, we're partying yep, or whatever yep. wow it's not out. a party drug it's no. a medicine yeah yeah and it's that, same thing with weed man it's mm -hmm. medicine it's not a party drug yeah accepting I, that's hard too yeah i try i like microdose weed uh -huh. now i'm not trying to just get like blasted stoned, stoned. Right. yeah no i got shit to do yeah i debated that before this podcast and i'm going i was like should i get just stoned and then i can really talk and but then I got to thinking, I was like, dude, you always say that, and then you end up getting stoned and freezing like an idiot. I'm like, when has it actually helped you any? You know what I mean? Yeah, it doesn't it's, open up conversation too yeah, much. Yeah, it doesn't, dude. Yeah. And like being able to like separate the two, like understanding it's medicine, it's not something that enhances, you know, necessarily like my speech or my athleticism. It's just something I can supplement with maybe at the end of the night. Mm -hmm. And being able to accept that takes a lot of maturity, a lot of growth. I mean, yeah. even up until this year, dude, I still have trouble, you know? Yeah. Like just being like, I'm not going to get high before training. Oh, but it's just jujitsu. And everyone says, if you get high, you retain things. But I know deep down that's not fucking true. I'm like, bro, it's not that. Weed is medicine. Weed is this. It cannot help yeah. me with jujitsu. You have to back off of it. And then you get more out of it when you do use it. You yeah. know, and, and this was almost like cool because some people smoke all day every day and i was that person for decades and, and how I, do you know the difference between being high and sober right well and i can tell in my performance and my speech my delivery i'm like oh, fuck what was that word and all that shit i hate that and it makes it drives me crazy which is i did not smoke right before this i smoked this morning yep same and then i didn't smoke again right yeah so there's a time and a place yeah there's time and place yeah time place i just i mean maybe some guys they would get stoned before a podcast i have a freestyle a, a and they'll kill it times. yeah but I, I the thing that comes down to it too that i've learned as i got older there's so many fucking strains and mm -hmm. each one actually does do something as mm -hmm. much as you act like oh i don't taste or do this like dude it's science it does actually do something and when you accept that and kind of really understand thc for what it is you can really uh pick and choose what's best and suitable for the environment you're mm -hmm. approaching. Like, yeah. dude, you don't want to smoke indica, you know, before going to the weight room, you're going to feel tired. And, right. You know, yeah. Same I, thing, smoke, you know, I have it all sativa before bed. Exactly. People don't even know these terms. And then there's also like, I go to dispensaries and I was like, um, I need a really, really strong sativa, a really strong indica. And then the guy goes, well, there's no such thing as indica anymore. It's all hybrids. And I'm like, dude, all right, I'm out. Ah. I can, but you tell me that, but I can, when I smoke, I know it, the difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, so, right. So like, there's people who understand it and people who don't, and I think understanding it is a huge part and being able to have fun with it. I always yeah. buy all three. Also, I got and I have my sandwich. sativa for the morning, and hi hybrid hybrid throughout yep. the day, and then indica at night. Yeah, and like I don't really vary wa a waiver. Are you hearing anything, or is that just? S a ringing in my ear. I heard a small static. Oh no, I just heard. Well, yeah, this, hopefully my my brother. He's gonna be like, "There's a little bit of static." <laughs> Sorry, we'll edit that out, clean that up in the audio. <laughs> but older or younger? He's younger. He's younger. he's he owns Sheath with me. Um, How'd you start Sheath? We never. I was in Iraq on my okay. second tour, 2008. It was hotter than the devil's balls, and it was 115 degrees. I, ha I had a, I was in a special unit that we were on call 24 seven for uh, special occasions, if Holy you will. Fuck. And, but we, it had been pretty chill for the, my whole second tour was super chill. My first tour was insane. My the second oh. tour I had made rank. I was Sergeant. I led the team. It was this team of five of us. We had our own little compound and so we were kind of separated from the rest of the whole base and but our generators had gone out the water had wasn't working for a few days now and so and like if you see my skin right here it's kind of yeah like, i see uh, that irritated and so i have like sensitive skin eczema okay. i don't know if you've heard, of heard that. Of it, yep. yeah exactly so i already have sensitive skin and i'm like sweating oh, and super right yeah and i have these weird underwear on that army had issued that 
you know, you wash your clothes with other soldiers. I somehow ended up with somebody else's underwear. I'm wearing like these giant whitey tidies that are sagging. They're uh, cutting into my thighs. And so it's the whole, the whole situation is just super uncomfortable. And they say necessity is the mother of invention. And I just felt like what a profound moment. Yeah. I was like, my balls are so uncomfortable. I need something to change the situation. So I grabbed a hand towel and I just like separated my balls from everything else. And I was like, what if the underwear had a pouch that could just had it, had it built in and separate everything. And, and I, we had internet access, so I was like, somebody has to have, in, have invented this. So I start searching pouch underwear online, and I couldn't find anything. And I was like, are you telling me since Jesus, nobody has thought of this? Like, I'm thinking to myself, I'm not the first person to think of this, you know? Uh -huh. and, I, and I couldn't find it online, so I decided to make some. I went and bought some underwear, I got some scissors, and I took it to the tailor. We have tailored, you know, to maybe tailor your uniform for whatever reason, so uh -huh. we have tailors in Iraq. And I took him this <clears throat> underwear, I took him a drawing, and I was like, sew this pouch in the underwear. And they were uh, third country nationals, so they, did, they barely spoke English. They were like our servants, which was really weird. We had like servants over there, basically. And it's badass. Like for cooking, they cleaned our bathrooms. Holy and, fuck. They're probably getting paid. I mean, better oh yeah. than what they would be, you know? Yeah. Otherwise, it would have been us and we were supposed to be focusing on the mission on now, type yeah. thing. No way. Yeah. So they snickered, you know? They were like, hee hee. But they made it. I went back a few days later. I got them. They put the pouch in there. I took them home, try, or whatever, tried them on. And the pouch was too tight. It was like this tiny little pouch. But I didn't. So. Um, but the concept was there and I, and it did work. So I started toying with it. And when I got back home, I, I bought a sewing machine and I started, re I re I sewed pouches, like all these different shaped pouches inside my existing underwear. And then I made some for my friends and most of the people, except my closest friends, it's really weird. You know who you are, <laughs> if you're watching this, they were supportive <laughs> and to this day. And always be your own people. Yeah. They, I mean, to this day, I'll be checking Instagram and my buddy's working out and I'll see his waistline and he's wearing Hanes and I'm like, I'm, we were like best friends. Why? And you, could not, you cannot use the pouch. Right. You know, Just, into the regular underwear. underwear. Yeah. I got I got my stuff in a pouch right now. I always rock in the pouch. Every now and then I'll be like, oh, I'm not in the pouch. <laughs> I've fought every fight since working with you guys. I've fought in every fight with the, wow. with the pouch. It's like a ritual for me. Because it's just like it, it feels a certain way and I have to just stick with that now. I like that. Yeah. Do you do the tie cup or do, what kind of cup? I do the tie cup. So typically people put skin on, you know, the tie cup. Mm -hmm. That causes a lot of your... I think I have a skin issue too. Get irritation easy i can't even wear watches interesting um but the cup directly on my skin gives me a lot of irritation so i'll put on the underwear first and because it's the sheath it feels like they're in a cup yeah and then i put the cup on it doesn't but if i didn't have the sheath they would be that level of friction you understand mm -hmm. it's weird it's I, something people uh, fighters look into I, i'm serious i'm not bullshitting this isn't like a clip an this. ad this is real stuff yeah no really it it uh it uh it, so i i'm it keeps sure the there's gotta be other place. fighters and wrestlers out there with the same issue yeah and i have a legit cup and everything you know it's diamond and they're a great company mm -hmm. to work with too and it, it, it i just get skin irritation down there dude it's sensitive skin and uh the cup directly on skin's never been for me yeah everyone tells me like what the hell are you doing I'm like, dude i can't wear it directly on my skin you're not the first kyle the not monster the nelson does that same exact thing really? where he wears the cup over the underwear yeah the sheath helped out so much having that power because it feels like you're already in the cup and then put it on the cup isn't like a second thing mm -hmm. versus if i don't have sheath underwear i just got regular underwear and then i put the cup on i can feel the two and i'm like oh this is so much shit. nice and then i gotta put another thing over the cup sometimes to keep it really secure depending if i know i'm a wrestler or not mm -hmm. I, I wear a little bit different yeah yeah so hell yeah okay well i mean it, it was kind of an accident you know how we invented it but it's a great invention dude wow i can't the story is profound thank you you're right necessity brings invention yeah and my and so it was it, that was 2008 it's 2023 it was 2010 15 when, years 16 yeah years almost. i did a early launch in 2010 but i remember my younger brother that's kind of how this came up and he's going to be editing this and he <laughs> He was the one that kind of was like, dude, what are you fucking doing? Like, you have this idea. We need to turn this into a company. I'm in the army. I'm trying. I'm just going to do my 20 years. I knew I had a good idea, but I was dragging my feet a little bit. 
and he kept just like prodding me okay let's that do this let's system. do this yeah. yeah and and so i i will i give him a lot of credit he Hell came up yeah, with the man. name sheath we were both we were brainstorming names for like a year i feel like i remember wow. he flew into town and we were just southern comfort you heard of the drink yeah the drink soco yeah oh yeah and that was one that was one of our first ideas and i was like <laughs> uh -huh. right, that's fair and then junk drawers was junk drawer. that was my that was my name and i'm so glad somebody else another underwear company had already taken it because it's cool but it's not like classy i see i see like nike or something yeah. sheath, sheath people are like everyone loves the logo everyone loves the name it it makes sense it's clean sheath. yeah 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 right and sheath. yeah <laughs> it's badass like it's warrior this uh I, I just gotta ask now since i'm on here uh did a kangaroo inspire you at all yeah I mean, and inverted have, right? inverted kangaroo pouch did you think about that at all I'll, wait it's afterwards yeah yeah. It's like a kangaroo pouch for your same. Joey. I always thought that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it looks like a fucking kangaroo pouch. Yeah, that's how I ex explain it to people. Because you you said you went through your own design, sewing, and stuff, so you had to ultimately come with one. That's funny. Mother Nature always knows best. Yeah, and it just cradles the Joey <laughs> in this perfect little pouch. What are, what are we at on time over here? Uh, shit. Let's see. One hour and thirty minutes. What? We went off, dude. Nice. I'm a talker, bro. This is why my wife hates me going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> when she, I go to practice or sparring, she's like, I'll just come with you. I'm she like, must be pretty cool. She's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So I've been with her for uh, 11 years. Wow. Since I was 16, technically 15. That's cool. But um, we've been dating since, you know, the beginning of high school, all throughout college. The, my entire MMA career, of course, she's the one that got me into it, really, you know, just like your brother prodding me. And then we finally got married this uh, summer. Nice. I took a little too long, obviously. But. Yeah. I mean, that's like a fairy tale. That's it, what, I mean. yeah, it, was, it was. For me, it was a dream come true. So I actually met her. This is this crazy show. I met her when I was 12 years old. I was in the sixth grade. And my best friend, the witness at my wedding, Casey Townsend, I told him in sixth grade, I said, dude, I'm going to marry Logan Woodward. And he's like, you're fucking crazy, kid. You know, like, he's a sixth grader. He's like, you're crazy. He's like, it's like I'm, I was like, no, I love her so much. I was like, she's so beautiful. And then from sixth grade to eighth grade, I was just obsessed with her. And manifestations real, bro. I made it happen. Yeah. Freshman year, and I, yeah, that's the only girl I've ever loved and wanted to be with since I could literally like a girl. And I love that. I'm now married to her. It's fucking awesome. I love, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. It's crazy because I, I I've never uh, gone to the dating scene. I've never understood like trying to find your match. So I, it's for hard for me to uh, conversate with people about that stuff. Cause I don't have a perspective on it. So I always tell people, I don't know how you feel, but I can give you this insight. And you know, cause I really don't know, man, I've been in love with her my whole life. And wow, I mean, it's been perfect. Like since yeah, the sixth grade, it's that's like, insane. Cause you know, <laughs> cause she just, was my, she was my first kiss. That's beautiful. Ever. First kiss. Yeah. I think that and is amazing. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. You know, you, we live the pro athlete, the fighter lifestyle and, a lot comes with it. It's a lucrative lifestyle. It can be and all that. And she's helped me keep my feet grounded. And I don't make the same mistakes a lot of the guys do. Yes. So I, I, I truly feel powerful with her. I feel we have a power couple relationship thing mm -hmm. going on because I look at other fighters and stuff who don't have that and they make a lot of mistakes. Or, yeah. If you're unstable in your relationship, yep, that can cause all cheating, kind of mental. Lying. Yeah. When money and fame comes, then it really shows, you know, what your foundation is. I like Michael Bisping and his, him and, yeah, and his, his, him and his wife. Huge fan, dude. Yeah. They still, they're still together and they're awesome. like, do they're everything. Yeah. Even Conor McGregor, people want to hate on him, dude, yeah. but he's one of the most real little guys. He, the people around him are blessed. And honestly, everybody in this whole freaking city, he's hes like a Robin Hood. Yeah. Like everyone wants to talk all this crap. They don't even know the guy. Right. I, w I think, thinking back, I wish I would have uh, <clears throat> sponsored like everyone at his gym in oh, Ireland. Oh, SPG, yeah. yeah. But how would you have known? You know? yeah. It's like a stock. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we don't know. So <laughs> we're going to we're gonna circle back to the very beginning and we're going to wrap it up. Okay. Because, but the we're, like the very first thing we were saying was something about, like you were t mentioning the Kennedys and uh -huh, the family. In, in Washington, yeah. Yeah, and they, and they have that dynasty. Absolutely. Even today, right? Robert Kennedy is... I know. So what do, you, what, do you th what, what are you thinking about him? I'm a huge fan. Me too. I think he's a little bit kind of loony, but so am I. Yeah. Maybe so are you too, so yeah. you might agree with this too. Yeah. Um, but I almost see like he's like an older version of myself in the sense that he cares about the same things. He's very into the physical, 
you know, aspect of life. It reminds me of, um, fuck, I was just about to say it reminds me of JFK. It's his brother. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm obviously a big history guy, so yeah. I study governmental history, specifically the U.S. I'm very interested in our political history and kind of why it is the way it is today. I truly believe the more you study history, the more you'll understand about our politics today. Yeah. Um, and uh, for example, I, a lot of people don't know about this, but the Democratic Party was actually the uh, slave owner party, and for a long time they were the anti-black, anti-minority party. So. You should definitely be questioning yourself if you're a minority on the left. I know, day. right? You should probably study history. I think yeah. a lot of people are um, swayed the wrong way. But yeah, RFK, dude, I'm a huge... I, If I could pick him over Trump or DeSantis, I would. But I truly believe nobody stands a chance to Trump just based off his his popularity. Yeah. He is so popular. He's like Andrew Tate. Like when I think of the most popular people on the planet right now, that they can't walk anywhere without 100 armed guards there's three guys that popped to my mind andrew tate elon musk and donald trump wow i think those are three most influential most popular human beings alive i'm gonna blow your mind real quick Go for it. we just got offered the opportunity to work with andrew tate holy shit dude come on <laughs> it's, i mean so everyone i've told sign the contract i know everyone i've told that's not on my team it says has that exact same response but my team they're all like yeah but he's controversial he hates women and it's gonna cause a backlash so i haven't done anything actually it's funny i agreed to do it and then I, I, I told him, I was like, Just hold on, let's wait. Because mm -hmm. before I told anyone on my team or my wife or anything, because what actually happened is we started sponsoring Russell Brand, oh, wow. which is amazing. Holy shit. Right? Yeah. On, he's exclusive on Rumble. I do. I watched Run DMV. What, what is that? What? The show, Russell Brand. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Keep going, keep going. Well, and he, he is still on YouTube. But he's mostly on Rumble now, and he's always on YouTube saying to go to his Rumble page. And so we actually sponsored the interview he did with Ron DeSantis, which oh was my gosh. which was pretty dope. But the return wasn't that great, and and so I was like, maybe they're inflating the numbers of Rumble. So I'm gonna I was decided to wait on Andrew Tate because of the numbers I got from Brand. I was like, if Brand isn't giving me the numbers I need. I don't know how Tate is going to do because Russell Brand is obviously mm -hmm. a huge influencer also. And I, sorry, I, I made a little, uh, I got to correct myself, I, wrong Russell there on Run DMV. Okay. Uh, Russell Brand is still very influential. Yeah. But I don't know, man. I don't think the comparison of Brand to Tate is even fair. It's yeah, like okay. comparing apples to oranges. Okay. I know that sounds insane or whatever, but I, uh, dude, Andrew Tate. Uh, he's a, I mean, he's, he's he, crazy. He's I mean, not crazy. He's like prominent figures. I know. On Earth right now. So we have access to it. I don't think it, I, 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 um, I, I just think anything that he touches turns to gold personally. Yeah. I think him, Trump and Elon, uh, Musk. Elon Musk have that about them, that persona, that, uh, aura. Yeah. <clears throat> and I mean, dude, fate loves irony. So if you feel that this is ironic, I mean, fate loves irony. I feel like it is pretty ironic. It's a pretty big name. I know. And it's just, it's crazy how, what a position we're in because of all the people we've worked with. J, yeah. JP Sears. It is, seems like you're slowly just getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. Oh, well, we could get Donald right, Trump they, Jr. They told right, us. Oh my God. We, and and I, has, I'm, I haven't done him for the same reason. Like I'm, I, if it was just me, I would be like, I understand. Hog. I understand. It's very divisive. It's a very yeah. divisive uh, subject. Either yeah. or. Yeah. So I'm Divide just, I'm, I'm left and right. Holding off for the time. As a being. company, it's hard to make those decisions, right? I yeah. can only imagine. You probably want to shoot towards guys who are more in the central, in the middle. You know, even though you might not believe that, like your core values might not align with it, you have to look at your company and what's mm -hmm. best for your family and your company. And that's yeah. that's kind of the the thing about being a business owner. It's like, a it's a yeah. There's a ripple effect, and yeah. I'm just I'm just. I'm holding off, but also I, you like fuck, man. If it's gonna blow up, <laughs> I know. Yeah, so it's it's on the it's 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 on the table. So it's an option. That's crazy, dude. Yeah, that's crazy. So, Congratulations. Yeah, I'm very blessed. Whether you do it or not, I mean, it's a sign you're doing the right thing, right? Yeah, we're moving. From 2008 till now. Yeah. Did you taste on the table? I know. It's dude. crazy. We were gonna go. I was gonna go meet Dana White recently at the uh, at the fight. Slap what if you, fight what if you thing. get in the UFC cages? That's and... that's the goal. It's still, it's been the goal. It? It's, it's still the goal. We're just, that's a big, you know, dollar amount that we haven't of course, yeah. reached just of course. yet, but we're on the way. I, think. I could do it. I could see, I just bring it up. Cause I could see it on the mat. That does, yeah. Too easy. Howlerhead.
Manscaped, we're coming, baby. And we met the people at uh, the Manscaped people. They're really cool, and we're in the same. They're just demo. like men's. Yeah, they sh- it's actually ball shaving oh, stuff. That's the company Ball Wash. Yeah, Manscaped. Manscaped owns that. Yeah, yeah, because a, a bunch of my buddies are sponsored by them. Yeah, they have the Ball Wash, whatever. Yeah, they sponsor like so many people. That's what it is. Okay. Yeah, and they're huge, but we're on our way. Yeah, you are definitely. Yeah. There's no doubt. I mean, the proof's in the pudding. Yeah, Holy and God. you're on your way. I am. The so proof's the, in the pudding there too. Yeah, <laughs> I like the whole vibe. I'm, I now I I'm not sad that it took so long to get together, but it I'm glad we did. Yeah, me too. Yeah, this I is feel really like cool. we get along on a personal level. You know. Yeah, I talked to Jacob Parga, and he was like, "Don't bring up politics," and I was like, ah, "I can't promise anything." <laughs> Basil said the same thing, and I was like. This will be great then, because that's that's like right up my alley. Shout out to Jacob Parga. Every time I talk to him, he tells me the same thing. Bro, please don't bring up politics. No, it's fun. And, it, and I'm like, all right, I got you. And then I do the same thing I do to my mom. Yeah. <laughs> the complete opposite. Yeah. You just do your thing. Be. I just can't I, help myself. I'm not trying authentic. to be a troll either. People think I'm trying to troll. I'm just myself. Yeah, I can't hold it back. I like it though. Yeah, Somebody's got to say this shit because people like me. I, sometimes I have to like reserve my opinions. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Well, Andrew Tate's one of those guys. Yeah, right? That's exactly. What got him so Donald Trump? Mm-hmm. Elon Musk. They just say the truth. Shit, even Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, I mean he's got his own opinions, and they're not. I don't agree with all of them, but right. shit, he speaks what he feels. I'm I'm impressed with him as of lately. Well, can you say yeah, yeah. I, dude? I'm a huge. Uh, proponent and fan of anyone that's successful and you brought up logan and jake paul i hate to keep extending this but that's okay um i had the same whole cycle with them too i was actually in the youtube era like as a kid watching all their videos growing up when they were popular Mm -hmm. i was that era like wow we were watching all their crap i remember when they did the suicide forest thing yeah everyone in my class everyone in our generation is like no nah, fuck these guys yeah we're not doing this because we're kind of like the depression like anxiety yeah era you know a lot of kids my age are just plagued with that mental disease and when they saw these two assholes making fun of people commit suicide dude it killed them in my yeah. generation it killed them yeah nobody liked them anymore and it was all like let's you know hate them and boycott them and then as time went on they just came out of nowhere on this mma boxing youtube fight scene like uh, it was insane and i was like these are the same fuckers like f- that we hated for the suicide thing da, da, da. and i was like well and i looked at it and i was like dude i've done things too that if exactly. somebody recorded and i've said things that yes. if somebody recorded when you were hold young. on to the rest of my life yeah and say i'm a piece of shit mm-hmm. how can we keep doing that and like you watch them now and these guys are literally vouching for rights for myself. Mm-hmm. I don't even know these guys. Mm-hmm. And they're fighting for rights for me mm-hmm. and other guys like me. And they're doing so much for this sport that I just love. I adore this sport. And yeah. Seeing two too. randos, per se, doing so much for the sport. And the thing I love the most, how could I hate on these guys? They changed. They're not the same. Yeah, they grew. Kids. They matured. And I was an asshole, too. Yeah. I, we talked about before the trips and the martial arts. I was the same way. We all are. We're yeah. all young boys. I mean, unless you're freaking raised somewhere yeah. communist. <laughs> or, yeah. You just don't have... They had the freedom to be themselves, express themselves. They made some bad Try decisions. Try growing up in America and not doing the same. Yeah. That's what I tell anybody. You're probably just... You probably didn't... I don't know. You probably didn't grow up where we grew up. Well, he's fighting this weekend, and but that documentary... I, I think it just it came it out. on Netflix? Yeah, it just came... Okay. I, it, it's 2023. I don't know. It has to be since the... the t- uh, Tyson Fury, okay. not Tyson. Because he the fought Fury. the Tyson guy. Yeah. Not, I know. Tommy, we, Tommy. Tommy Fury. Yeah. Tommy Fury. Yeah. And so it chronicles from the beginning of the YouTube, in all, all their amateur fights, how the fighting thing started. What's his name? Jake was like a suicidal. He didn't Holy know what shit. he was going to do after they lost. They were the most famous people on the planet to the absolute zeros. No. And he was just like, what am I going to do with my life? Somehow... It describes but he got into boxing and it like saved his right. life and and everyone's making fun of him you're not a real boxer but he and but he's like you don't know how much i love this yeah and how do you hate on that or yeah. how do you how am i or you to determine how much he yeah. loves something per se yeah and that's the thing too again i'm just a huge fan of success and success stories i think anyone who's successful has the exact same not the exact same a synonymous story to you and i where you have those epiphany points and those maturity growth you know points and uh 
I look at Jake and Logan Paul and I see myself just like you probably do too. Yeah. And any other successful real recognize real. Real recognizes real and Shit. They, a lot of the principles that I applied to build sheath the, the just the visualizing, stay positive, don't quit. Like those are three main like uh pillars of success and this is like a po positive attitude, uh -huh. visualizing what you want to happen and then zeroing in and making it happen and staying positive. You're going to come against obstacles. Do, pe most people quit when these obstacles present themselves. That's the universe trying to test you. If you just don't quit, eventually the universe is going to be like, okay, you're not going to quit. Yes. We're going to open the doors. Yes. Yeah. You broke free of, uh, Andrew Tate says the matrix. Yeah. He broke the matrix is the universe and you keep just biting or punching back and you'll break free. And you're on the other side looking in and you're like, holy shit, what are these guys doing? Yeah, and it's like, it ends up, you look back and I was watching the Kardashians the other day with my wife and, and Kim was saying, it's like magic. Yeah. And it, and there's, if you, you got to believe in a little bit of magic yep. in this universe. Yep. Have you read The Alchemist by any chance? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That Pablo was the Coelho. most profound book. I know. Whole it's like this simple story of I a kid. I recommend that to everybody. Such, I've read everybody. it a few times. I don't care. Read anything you want, but you have to have that in there. Yeah. Check you it out. To. You have to. Read The Alchemist. Yes. <laughs> Follow Harris here. Follow Sheath and yeah. my man Bobby the Bank. Yes. Please do that. And this has been, this is my longest podcast. Heck yeah. I which feel is cool. Honored. And, I, and I, this was great. Yeah, it was a good one. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Appreciate All right. it, Bobby. Oh, the elbow. <laughs> That's, it's fine. No. Now, uh, anyways, it's fun. The skateboard accident. Yeah. Stay young. Forever young, baby. <laughs> All right, we'll see you next week. And when you, and you're fighting see in, you guys. Octo oh, in October. October 27, LFA main event in Vail. So, oh, Vail, perfect. Yeah, Vail, Colorado. We'll Hopefully last regional fight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. You're gonna. I mean, you might get a short notice call before that. Manager said we might get contender series before that. Ooh. So I'm actually staying ready for that, just in case. That's in September. Nice. Next month. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Okay. I take 11 seven-day fights, so this two months is... Uh, they can, almost like uh, they're doing me a service. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll be we'll be we'll be watching sweet more Heck closely yeah. now. All right. Peace, everyone. See you guys.